Coming up on Market to Market, farming is stressful enough on its own. Add in a pandemic, and has it all become too much? A panel to help you find resources and assist others in rural America. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is a Market to Market special report. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Mental health is almost a taboo topic for some, and others may tell you about their treatment plan for anxiety or depression. Talking about it is step one. That's why we've assembled a panel of those in the fields, both agricultural and clinical. Joining us on this panel, Dr. Michael R. Roseman. He is clinical psychologist and a fourth generation farmer from Harlan, Iowa, who works with rural Americans on behavioral and economic welfare. Adrienne DeSutter is a former counselor, farm wife, and mom in Knox County, Illinois, on a grain hobby cattle farm. Emily Kreckelberg is with the University of Minnesota Extension. She's an educator for them on farm safety and health. And Angie Setzer is the VP of Grains for Citizens Elevator based in Michigan. To the four of you, and she's also a regular contributor to our program as an analyst. Good to have all four of you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Angie, I'm going to start Thank with you. you. Uh, you're always sitting here and we're talking about the economics of things. Are we going higher? Are we going lower? You're dealing with farmers on a regular basis. You probably have talked to 10 of them today. What are they ever tell? Are they ever telling you anything other than is corn going up, corn going down? Do they ever bend your ear about something else? Definitely. Um, not just farmers that I work with directly, farmers that I've encountered through social media, through our virtual peer group, um, through all of the, the different channels, it seems that we can communicate. And, and it's, it's a common theme that I'm hearing, you know, it's just this stress and this, this heavy mental load is what I've been calling it. It is something that we've definitely been talking about. I see us running into de decision fatigue often, um, especially now that it seems like every time you turn around, you're having to make another decision that you don't want to make and that leads to yet another decision and another decision and so you know I'm, I'm talking to to hundreds of farmers a week across the countryside here and, and it's it's very common you know just to hear kind of that sound or that you know the the underlying tone in the conversation of you know what what do I do how do I fix this and and you know where do we go from here not something that they probably taught you in school when you started doing this. I just want to let you know uh, that you will see phone numbers at the bottom of your screen as Angie was talking there. Uh, those will be, and those are a few of the options available for seeking help if you need it. So you can also search the web for services in your area. Adrian, in your area there in Knox County, uh, south of the Quad Cities, north of Galesburg and Peoria, you're on the farm, you're dealing with it. First uh, off is, are, uh, is corn and soybeans. Are they both in the ground for you right now? We are fortunate to have all of our planting um, done so right now. That's step one. That's that that helps right there because you know how big of a deal that is. So, living the day to day life on the farm, uh, how do you try to put things in perspective as a professional with your professional hat mm -hmm. and your and your farmer hat? How do you put, how do you just put those two together? Well, you kind of have to <laughs> because uh, those of us on the farm, you know, living farm life. Um, we're, we're constantly dealing with stressors. Um, you know, unfortunately, this pandemic has, has brought a lot of stress across the nation, across the world, when it comes to, uh, you know, 
being surrounded by family more than we're used to when it comes to being isolated, when it comes to, um, you know, just having that uncertainty, that financial pressure, there's a lot of stressors happening right now, um, with everyone that unfortunately are not necessarily new to farm life. There are definitely some new circumstances that have, have come up in agriculture, but this stress that, um, the stressors we're dealing with are, are something that we're, we're unfortunately used to having to combat. So, um, you know, because I'm a counselor, I'm able to, when I entered the world of agriculture, I met my husband eight and a half or so years ago, um, kind of learned about how all of these stressors play into um, not just the occupation of farming, but the entire lifestyle. Yeah. Um, because because it is it's a lifestyle so it, we kind of have to work that out it is emily uh you travel to farms grew up on a dairy farm there in minnesota we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago where you were telling me about uh some of the physical sides of injuries that can happen and the mental sides of injuries i want to ask you first though are you doing okay are you fine when you hear somebody say i'm fine are they no I am a big proponent of, and it's kind of a Minnesota or Midwest thing, right? You go, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And I think especially if you've ever been in a relationship and if your significant other goes, I'm fine. They're not, oh my gosh, it's not fine. It's not fine. You need to figure out what's going on. Um, so yes, I today am, am better than fine. I am doing swell. You're doing swell. So that's the new way I should approach this one. Uh, when you talk to groups, and at some point you will talk to groups in person. I mean, you're doing some of that remotely now. Kind of hard to look somebody in the eye. Physically, can you tell someone has maybe some challenges or maybe needs to have an extra question or a follow-up asked to them? You know, stress can manifest itself in a lot of different ways, and that is a part of some of the work that I do is teaching people, both farmers and agribusiness professionals who work with farmers, how to recognize some of those signs of stress. And physically, um, you know, we can see things like if they complain a lot about being sick or I have a headache or my shoulders hurt, you know, if we're carrying tension from being, uh, you know, tensed up all the time. Uh, also, people may uh, start to slip on their grooming. So if you notice uh, you know, maybe they haven't showered. That's just because my stylist hasn't been available. Right? Just, yeah, I know. Okay? It's hard to say, like, cut oh, I haven't cut their that. hair. You know, <laughs> but um, yeah. So there's um certainly things you can look for, and I would say the biggest thing I notice, and I, it's one of those things that's kind of difficult to explain. Uh, but I am very much a person who is big on eye contact, and you can usually tell just by looking somebody in the eye um, if something is wrong. Yeah. Part of that, I think, kind of just ties into human intuition or you get that gut feeling. And, you know, for me, that is really something that I notice is just, or if they won't look at you, uh -huh. especially somebody who usually will make eye contact. So people I deal with regularly and suddenly they're very standoffish. That is usually a big, uh, big red flag for me. That Some, they, something little, to watch. Little something more. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mike, you've been on several programs across the country, across the world. You've been at this, unfortunately, a couple of years in the sense of you've seen stress over time. We've talked to you in the past about the farm crisis of the 1980s. When you hear what you've just heard from the first three talking about, and you know what's going on on the farm now, how similar is what you're hearing today versus what you heard and witnessed in the 80s? Is there any similarities and are there any differences? Uh, thank you. There are considerable similarities. Back in the 1980s, people had little control over the factors that were causing the stress on the farm. Those stressors then were uh, a very high interest rate, which of course is very different now for farmers who are borrowing money either for long-term investments or for short-term loans. Uh, but now that uncertainty has exceeded the farm crisis of the 1980s. And I think that's why we're hearing allusions clear back to the Great Depression of the 1930s when we listen to newscasts. The current time is just as uh, Angie and uh, Adrian and Emily have been describing. That is, we have uh, the 
foundation of very low farm prices that has always caused concern for farmers. But currently we have the overlay of COVID. Uh, on May 13, I participated in a telephone conference call with a number of operators of farm crisis uh, telephone and hotline services. Across the board, everybody was saying that the number of callers uh, to these free services has increased greatly. One hotline said 50,000 calls in the past two months. Yeah. Wow. And I'm, and I'm hoping that it's, that's the peak, but we, well, let's be realistic about this, Angie. We know that there's going to be more. Uh, I, I had a conversation with a, a farmer yesterday, Angie, and it was a guy who has uh, livestock. He has hogs, and he put them, he got a new shipment, 20 pounds, 40 pounds at most, and he put it on Facebook that he was going to have to figure out a way to sell them because he knew his end destination didn't have an opportunity and was not going to be able to take those animals. He said, I struggled to mow under the haw or the, the soybeans last year when I misplanted something. That physically hurt my stomach because I asked him, what if you have to euthanize these animals? And he says, I don't know how to do it. And we did get a question that was emailed to us. How do we safeguard mental health while euthanizing animals? I mean, do you have that discussion with somebody from a financial sense? Then I'll get the emotional side of this first. Angie? The financial sense, I mean, it's almost too much to, to wrap your arms around. I mean, we're still trying to figure out, we had the USDA discussion on, on what the the coronavirus uh, safety nets look like, you know, and, and everyone's still trying to figure out what, what that means. What kind of, you know, are there going to be government safeguards? Are there going to be, uh, is there going to be money coming in? Um, you know, I have a friend that, that they raise contract hogs and, and basically they've foregone rent uh, a couple different months, just try to, to try to help um, the, the person that, that's higher up than what they are to, to just continue to facilitate that relationship going forward. And, yeah, I mean, the financial aspect of it at this point in time, you know, I have a hog feeder that I work with here in Michigan, and the only thing he could keep saying uh, two weeks ago when we talked is, what a strange time. What what a strange time we live in. Now, they were fortunate enough that they weren't at that point where they were having to make the, the euthanization decision, but they were leaving barns empty. They weren't bringing in replacements once they had shipped the butcher hogs out, and that's not, it's, you know, it's, it's the same thing as having an empty bin in October. Like that's not, you are not mentally programmed mm -hmm. to, to function that way. And so, yeah, from the financial side of things, we're still trying to figure out what that looks like. Yeah. I think at this point, most anyone would tell you from the emotional side, I, I can well, only imagine. Yeah. And I'm going to ask Adrian, unfortunately she has to answer this one. So <laughs> you've got the kids at home, Adrian. Um, they can pick up even at a pretty small age when mom and dad are having some stress and they might know what's going on. You might have a kid that's 7 to 12 that knows what's happening. How do you talk through some of that scenario? Well, I think we have to be good examples in wellness in, in starting by taking care of ourselves, honestly. Um, you know, having those conversations are really important. Even I, you know, I have a, a daughter that's almost four and we already are talking about when mom has a tough time or when dad has a tough time. Um, and, and I think one thing that's important is that, you know, we know that farmers are really resilient. I mean, that's something that we are, um, you know, we have in our, in our, in our blood, I suppose, as farm families, um, but remembering that resilience doesn't begin with just staying positive and trying to fix the problem. Resilience starts with adversity and struggle. And, and instead of jumping to the solutions and how am I going to fix this and how am I going to cope, this, the number one, the start to resilience is just having stress and acknowledging that stress is okay and acknowledging that as a farm family, um, you know, that's going through some of these things, it's okay to be stressed. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be worried, um, fearful of what's going to happen. It's okay to be frustrated with the situation. You know, we're all in different places mentally, and and we just have to start by acknowledging that 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 having those feelings is okay. You know, when when we're ready to bounce back, we will. 
but um, yeah, having the being real about feelings and thoughts is really important with our farm families. All right, and and Mike, I'm not going to put you on the spot to be the resident guy who was there in the '80s, but I went through the '80s, um, and I remember. It was one of those things where it, the, the families didn't talk about certain things. Do you think we've learned the lesson that maybe what our parents didn't always bring us into the discussions, that maybe that wasn't healthy, and this time we're doing kind of what Adrian's talking about, is we are having some of those discussions on a more open platform? We are definitely seeing the agricultural producers being much more open in their discussions. Uh, talking about themselves. I think a lot of the credit for this shift belongs to the uh, publications that uh, farmers read and the television and radio shows that they listen to. It is commonly, uh, it's so common to have an article in a farm magazine about stress and what we can do about it. Uh, but besides just talking and being resilient, a step in those directions is to form a uh, support team. That helps not only to uh, bring others into the picture for finding solutions, but it helps us to have support teams because we can relate to one another and acquire expertise. This reaching out by farmers to others and for uh, expertise is a new feature that has emerged over the past uh, 30 some years since yeah. the farm crisis of the 80s. All right, Emily, um, you and I, when we chatted a couple of weeks ago, we kind of talked about how maybe at meetings someone will hang around and they don't want to necessarily be seen talking to someone like you because, oh, they're going to figure out that maybe I've got... Has that stigma gone away, or how do we get over that stigma for the, that gruff side that a farmer might have and, and, and be willing to talk to someone like yourself? Yeah, and for me personally, I've been an advocate for mental health for a long time. Um, I myself suffer from mental illness and, and have struggled with my mental health even you know as recently as a few months ago. And I find that you know, the biggest way we can break down stigma is by just continuing to talk about it, right? That's how you normalize these things. And, and yes, certainly when I'm at meetings or speaking with farmers, um, there are the ones that will very boldly and confidently walk right up to me, shake my hand, start sharing their story. You know, there's the ones that uh, if we're in a hotel that maybe has like a hallway to the bathrooms, I kind of lurk over there uh, because then they can have a little bit more of a private conversation, which I know that's what some people need. And for me, I, you know, I'm very much want to see mental health and, and those related topics in farming be normalized, but I also need to understand that you need to kind of meet people where they're at, um, you know, help bring them along with you. And so for some people, yeah, that's going to be a less confrontational approach to begin with. But I have found that a big piece in breaking down stigma is sharing not just my story, but stories of some of the farmers that I've worked with in the past. It is astounding to me how many people either tell me face to face or text me or email me or call me later or will write in an evaluation uh, for a seminar I've taught that go, I just had no idea that other people felt this way. Yeah. It's just nice to know I'm not alone. Well, and uh, relation is a huge issue we see. And that's, yeah, like people just think that it's only them. And so the more we talk about it, the more we can relate to one another and know that we're not alone. Uh, I could see uh, while Emily was talking, the, the other three were nodding their heads and I was getting an amen from the congregation. Angie, uh, your co-op group, uh, you have meetings. You've gone to meetings and talked to these farmers like we're talking about with Emily. On programs, yes, it's about maximizing yield or trying to top it just right to sell the profit. What's the conversation like in, in co-op groups that have a responsibility, I'm going to say it, to maybe slip in some of this discussion that we're having into the same program that's talking about timing the markets correct? Well, I definitely think that 
helping maximize and, and making sure that you're doing all of the things that I tend to talk about when I'm on market to market and talk about with farmers is what helps that mental health, you know, as we, we move ahead, right? Like, so we have conversations about thinking several months down the road and, and what that looks like and what we can do to help you sleep better at night. And, you know, obviously at, at this point in time, like no one's hit this market perfect. It's impossible to do so. But those that were proactive and that we've had these conversations about, whether it's stress, mental load, you know, struggles on, on maintaining a, a positive ROI and, and, you know, doing all the things that they need to do to, to maximize or hit, you know, you're never going to hit the top of the market, but sure as heck try, yeah. you know, those folks are, are in a better place, obviously, you know, right now as a whole than those that, that may not be. So it, it all is, to me, it's all encompassing. Um, in the sense that, you know, what can I do to help you make better decisions that will help you feel better mm -hmm. about what you're doing as we move ahead? And, and it's never going to be perfect. And, and that's part of it, too. I have conversations with my growers about what embracing imperfection in a marketing plan looks like, focusing on the things that we've done that have been very good and kind of learning from the things that haven't necessarily been as good. And so that's a constant conversation that I'm having with my growers because I'm I'm, I'm so intrigued by, you know, decision-making and personality yeah. types and all of those things that it, it really kind of has become a, a like I said, an all encompassing sort of approach that I take when it comes to, to addressing those questions that they may have. Adrian, you know that farmers can sniff out, uh, they really understand genuine conversation that people and, and expertise of certain things. You've been there, you know what I've gone through you and your husband, uh, you were telling me earlier this week, um, have a, a very personal story and, and you have sessions with growers in your area. How important is it, unfortunately, that you have to have that experience? Don't you wish you could just be talking about this without that experience and somebody wouldn't go through with an ultimate end of life situation? How do you try to bring somebody back that might be thinking about making that phone call with a loaded something on the other end? Oh, it's such a tough conversation to have, isn't it? I mean, and it, it never goes away. As I counseled in a school for six years, and any time I ever had to bring up the word suicide with someone, it still makes you, you know, you have your butterflies and you get uncomfortable. Um, but, but it's something that we have to do, and that's something that my husband and I have recognized that, um, you know, when when we were hearing about suicides in our area um, and just knowing some of the stresses that we were going through as a family and as a farm family in particular, um, we felt like we couldn't wait for a crisis to happen in our family. We couldn't wait until that was our story, until we had something tragic happen before we started to speak out. And that's why we, you know, we, we started doing some, um, you know, we, we actually write, articles in um, a publication regularly and we um, have well now webinars right, <laughs> regularly. right here we are um, but yeah but but I've done a lot of speaking at conferences and um, and and even actually I had just a, a, a seed salesman um, host an, a, an event in his shop. And so we, it was right in the midst of the farm, in the shop with farmer, local farmers in the area. And that's exactly what it is. It's meeting, just like Emily said, meeting them where they're at and that yep. genuineness, that real empathy. You know, you don't have to be a doctor or a therapist to have a conversation with someone. Really listen to what they're saying and, and express that empathy and say, this is hard. You know, this is hard that you're going through this but I'm, I'm going to be here with you through that. And I think that's something that, you know, when we talk about resources for farm families, we have to remember that we are our first resource. You know, we as an ag community and as an industry are the first resource, yep. we're the first in the defense to having those conversations. Adrian, I'm listening to you. I'm also listening to the producers telling me I got to wrap up. We have less than a minute left. I know we talk about uh, resources, primary care doctors, therapists, clergy, State University Extension Office. There's also the telehealth model. Real quickly, uh, Emily, you've got about 30 seconds here. Walk me a couple of coping mechanisms uh, before I maybe. Is it as simple as breathing? Is it as simple as talking? What do we have? Yeah, I think for some people, talking about the way that they're feeling is really useful. And I think if you're the listener, 
you need to ask the person, do you want me to fix this or do you just want me to listen? Because I'm a fixer. So I always want to fix. And so um, my one friend is like, Emily, I don't need you to fix. I just need you to listen. Listen, yeah. Talking, um, deep breathing, kind of grounding yourself. So a really easy one is just inhale. And as you inhale, think I am. And as you exhale, think here. You're just telling yourself, I am here. And I am so thankful to the four of you for being a part of this discussion. Uh, my thanks to the four of you, uh, Angie Setzer, Adrian DeSetter, Emily, uh, uh, Emily Kreckelberg, and uh, Dr. Mike Rosman. Thank you so much for the four of you for being here. And please remember that there are several options for seeking help during these trying times. We will put the phone numbers that you've seen on the bottom of your screen on our website. And remember, there are professionals out there that can help you if you need it. I thank you so very much for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.